Inside Malden, Ideas and Stories That Inspire. I am Osa Schwab, the host and executive producer. Today, my guest is Karen Sparacio, founder and executive director of Project Have Hope. Project Have Hope is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that seeks to empower women in the Chole Quarter of Uganda by providing education to both the women and their children assisting the women to establish business opportunities to promote economic stability and sustainability. Karen Sparacio, welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'm so curious, uh, given that your journey really has begun as a photographer, and I would imagine that that um, connection with photography started way back. Tell me a little bit about how you fell in love with photography. Ever since I was a child, um, I loved the idea of taking photos and capturing moments, um, moments in time that I could then reflect on later. Um, As I continued with my education, I had studied uh, communication history and then went on to pursue a degree in photography. So then at that point, I worked for newspapers for 11 years, uh, pursuing uh, photojournalism and documentary work. Um, And then uh, with that, the opportunities to travel both to Zaire uh, and to a number of other countries as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm also curious, I know there's this this physical ability to, to snap a moment in time and capture that. But then there's also what's lurking behind the eyes, your own vision. How does that, how did that play a role in your discovering photography? It's always interesting. You might have ideas and then you um, meet people, different situations, Mm -hmm. and it just evolves. And really, with the camera, you're there to capture what unfolds before you. So any preconceived ideas that you have really just kind of float away as the moment you know, it takes over. That's a wonderful statement. Uh, so it sort of uh, becomes an objective tool, or, or you're just observing, and you're letting what you observe inform you in a way? Oh, that's a good way of putting it. In a lot of ways, yes. It's, it's, there's always that struggle to, you know, like you go into a situation with ideas, mm-hmm. um, yes. and you know, like, to realize that sometimes what you initially thought was just completely way off. And Mm -hmm. um, it's very enlightening in that way as well. Um, And it's also very encouraging and very beautiful to have the opportunity to meet different people and to be in different situations, situations that you otherwise never would have had the opportunity to be in without having the camera. The camera really acts as the invitation to bring you into the different communities. I love that statement. Um, The camera is an invitation to bring you into a community. And then, as you say, the photographs that you take in turn invite other people into that community in some way, right? Absolutely. Photography is really a way of connecting people together. Um, The stories that you take and you share with your camera, you can then share with other people who view them people who would never have had the opportunity to see what you've seen and to experience that, can experience that through your photos and the stories that you tell. Mm -hmm. So it connects everybody together in the end. Yes, yeah. It makes me uh, wonder uh, how, as we evolve in our ability to use technology, for example, at one point the camera didn't exist, right? (laughs) So it sort of enhances, technology could enhance our ability to connect, in theory. Absolutely. It also does make it uh, more real-time. So, yeah. like, there's not, you know, like, the delay in seeing photos and um, mm-hmm. in that connection. And even in terms of with social media, the aspect of being able to connect people that way, even with the photos. Um, so, therefore, you know, like, many of the subjects in my photos, you know, like, you know, like through social media can connect with the people who are viewing the photos and create an exchange and a dialogue that's very interesting. That is very interesting. So do you see a difference in, let's say, when you are doing work as a photojournalist? Um, how, first of all, how would you describe that versus taking pictures of your surroundings, the beach or trees or... Well, 
um, totally different uh, world. It's funny, even in the photography as a child, um, it was very seldom about um, taking photos of objects per se, but it has always been about documenting life, mm. documenting people, mm -hmm. documenting what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. whether it's within my family or as I grew into the field uh, within the community at large. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, so for it. your so for you the main interest is people to to capture people absolutely some aspect of their everyday life yes and to be able to contribute in some way mm -hmm. um, with all the years of you know working for the newspaper my goal was always to tell stories mm -hmm. to encourage people to want to participate mm -hmm. to see something that mattered and mm -hmm. to therefore act upon that so I think that's the power of photography right. So there's a real active component here. It's like stimulating, not just like, oh, that's lovely, or that's a beautiful flower. <laughs> no, and that is, and there's and that that is a, a role, skill and right. a beauty, yeah, and course, we all absolutely. need beauty in our lives. No, 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 no question. Uh, <laughs> um, so what do you think is possible then with photography? I mean, you say it can promote action, and it can invite people into a community that might not otherwise feel part or be part. Um, can it really make changes? Uh, can it uh, uh, help promote peace? Can it help uh, address poverty? Can it help um, equalize economic uh, distribution of wealth? <laughs> yeah, well, I would like to think that that might be taking it a little bit far, but you're like, obviously, yes, yes, and yes to everything. Yeah. You're, like, you're, like, you're like, up until that. I think that um, you know, like the camera prevents people from living lives that are too insular. Once you see the situations and the experiences of other people, I think, and especially when those situations are less than what your situation is, mm -hmm. most people want to do something about that. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, you know, uh, send a bag of used clothes to people, but mm -hmm. it just, you know, like by having that idea of wanting to take action, mm -hmm. um, you start to come up with different ideas and different ways to promote change. And I believe that that helps alleviate poverty, mm -hmm. that that helps bring peace, just because you realize that we're all the same, you know, mm -hmm. and the factors and the things that are important in your life are the same things that are important to someone you know, like across the world in you know, like a very small, mm -hmm. perhaps you know, like impoverished community, but things like family, community, mm -hmm. those things matter to all of us, no matter where you are. And they are so beautifully expressed through the eyes and the, the smile that you know those are universal. So Absolutely. No matter where you're living or what clothes you wear. So... So you were a photographer, and you were working on a documentary, and something happened that you you talk about. Uh, it was kind of a shift when you encountered the Acholi people, um, and talk about that. I love what you say um, that it's that experience transformed you from being a photographer to a friend. It did, and it also it took me from being a photographer to an active participant. Um, up until that point, as I said, my goal was always to take photos that would encourage action. Mm -hmm. And I realized when I first you know, was welcomed into the Acholi Quarter in Uganda, and I started initially by photographing and just documenting their lives. And I realized that it was time for me to take action and that I needed to become an active participant and to get more involved, just like I was always trying to encourage other people to get more involved. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was my time. <laughs> um, and with that, over the years, that's, gosh, 11 and a half years ago now, um, we quickly went from, you know, like photographer to subject to, you know, close friends. So mm -hmm. it's been a really interesting ride. <laughs> that experience then so you were there on assignment and then you were talking with the people I'm trying to get you know visualize exactly you know 
visualizing you, you know, speaking with these people, and and then there were many conversations, perhaps, and then you were surprised at what they talked about as having experienced. Is that what was the yeah? Kind I mean, of... just to kind of you know, like summarize it, you know, like a little bit in that you know, like I was there, you know, like photographing uh, my first day in the community. I had visits with several of the women to learn more about them and their stories and. Um, the women were amazing and, and powerful and beautiful. And they're telling me, you know, through a translator, mm -hmm. their various stories. And essentially, a Chole quarter came to be because of the war in northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, so the Chole people were completely being decimated. Their homes were being burned down. So many of them resettled, um, or I should say a group of them resettled into this community that was safe down in southern Uganda, outside of the capital. Um, and so the stories that they would tell of having to flee their homeland uh, was just unbelievable. And by the time I got to the interview or the conversation with the third woman, um, to this day I really don't know her story very well because I kind of tuned out. And I was like, okay, you know, like, what can I do? There has to be something I could do. Mm -hmm. And so for the remaining couple of weeks that I was in the community photographing, there was that little thought process that kept going on about, okay, so what is the next step and how are you going to act upon what you found? And there was something else that you describe in the Acholi uh, women that you spoke with that, of course, it was uh, these horrible circumstances of being cast out of their homes in the north and um, uh, experiencing various tra traumatic uh, things, but there was something about their spirit, it seemed, from what you say, that that struck you as well. Yeah, absolutely. The, the joy, the happiness, the appreciation, the profound strength that they had, and the resilience. There was never, in any of their stories, there was never an idea of, oh, poor me, or this was terrible. Mm -hmm. It was more of, well, that happened, and now there's this, and this is good, and we are safe and we are prospering and you know that resilience was just very powerful so were they asking for anything or were they hoping for anything from I you or i can't speak of what they hoped for <laughs> <laughs> um in terms of asking there was absolutely never any request of anything oh no that's not true one small child a winnie who was five years old her mother asked me uh, to bring a doll for her, um, oh you know, in you know, like the two and a half weeks I was there, that was the one request that was made of me. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, every day they'd serve me, you know, like lunch and these elaborate meals. In the morning, they'd make tea for me, um, you know, constantly giving me different snacks of pineapple or mangoes or jackfruit or various things like that. So, if anything, it was the you know they were there to give you know, to me, not to ask for anything. Uh, and that leads me to wonder, what what is it about these people? I mean, like, is there some cultural um, uh, thread of um, community or uh, joy? I mean, it seems, you know, some cultures may be more predisposed to a certain uh, perspective in life, but... Um, what would you say? What, 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 how would you describe these people? I mean, in terms of their culture and why maybe they were so so positive. I think there's an appreciation of for what you have, and yeah. not that you're not aware of other things out there and that you don't want more, but you also know the greatness of what you do have. You have a home that is safe, that you're not concerned about someone coming and trying to kidnap your children um, or, burn your, or burn your home down, but you know, mm -hmm. just the act of being safe, and you can appreciate that. And mm -hmm. so although, granted, there are many things that you hope for and you dream of, the basics, uh, once you kind of appreciate those factors, mm -hmm. and I think in communities where we have so much, yes we forget the basics and to appreciate and to be grateful for those things. Whereas at least with the community um, and the friends I've made in the Acholi Quarter, 
they're grateful. And I think that underlies everything. And so they're appreciate they're appreciative of what they do have. Mm -hmm. And although they are always wanting more and working for more, right. they don't forget to take time to realize the greatness of what they have and the importance of the community. Um, together, they are able to achieve many things. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, we're so um, independent in spirit, mm -hmm. um, which is great in its own way. However, their dependence leads to an interdependence. And so therefore, they just count on each other in different ways, which um, it's, it's worth replicating. <laughs> well, there's certainly neuroscience that points to um, the role of social connections to happiness. And so clearly um, they're demonstrating that, you know, when you are connected with other people, you, you will generally be a happier person and healthier person in the long run. Um, so you were, you became a friend and then you took another step, which may be a different facet of being a friend. And you started this nonprofit organization, Project Have Hope. And tell me about the name, because it's obvious that the organization is about building on hope and instilling hope, And uh, but how did that came, come to be? I mean, was there, you know, some discussion or... Yeah, there are a number of different discussions. Um, yeah. Like, one, I wanted the women to be the ones who named the organization, because really it's their organization, um, just a part of it. Uh, a number of different names, you know, kind of uh, came up. Um, they themselves are, are very religious. Um, mm. I wanted to shy away from anything that was religious simply because mm -hmm. that's very personal. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anyone to feel that they were not a part of it because they had a different belief. Um, so with that, the name that really kind of surfaced was Have Hope. We Have Hope. Mm -hmm. You know, and so with that, you know, it became Project Have Hope. Um, In a way, it's very appropriate because um, the number of different projects that Project Have Hope uh, initiates or, you know, one could call them programs or different facets um, could be sort of considered as, you know, like different projects. So it kind of makes for a nice sort of... Um, Oh, we, we did this project and we did this project. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you talk about this uh, group of women. So when you founded Project Help Hope, there was a group of women who you had in mind or who were part of this, either in, in terms of staff or in terms of the kind of key people. It, yeah, it really developed out of the people my first visit who I spent the most time with. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I returned a few months later to formally organize the um, organization, um, with that, um, going back to the, I should say, with the organization, the main way we do fundraise is actually to sell the jewelry and the crafts that they make. Okay. And so they were making jewelry out of recycled paper. Again, this is back in 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. um, very you know, unique and novelty and so that was really the basis of how I intended to do the fundraising to do the programs that I hope to bring to them mm -hmm. and so when I formally organized the group um, in order to do that funding I needed to have products to sell mm -hmm. so I had limited my fun funds myself to be able to purchase items and so within the community and the women um, it was also women who uh, trusted me and were willing to provide me with um, some jewelry on a consignment basis. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's really kind of how the key women came together, and uh, they sort of were their own community of, okay, uh, here's this person, and we trust her, we believe her, mm -hmm. and we're going to see what happens. So that was really how we developed the group. And uh, that sort of leads to this question about how being a friend has influenced your uh, running of the organization because when I think of friend that has one feeling 
And then when I think of, you know, dr executive director of an, of an organization, that has another feeling. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how they connect. <laughs> it's a balancing act. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, so, I would imagine. You know, I, um, I would say the friendship is what has made it possible to have continued for over 11 years. Yes. Um, without that connection and mm -hmm. kind of that human element, that mm -hmm. friendship, it would be hard to continue. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the balancing act, um, it, it, it does become difficult in that mm -hmm. you, know, like, you want to, as a friend, do everything you can. Um, you also know that realistically it's not possible. And mm -hmm. to think about things like budgeting and what's the most important thing and you know, like what's the you know, like best way to spend that the, you know, like the money that we do mm -hmm. have what is the best programming mm -hmm. that will help the most people uh, so it's definitely a challenge <laughs> i would um imagine that but then i also think of as a a, a, a real friend is honest and sets boundaries and <laughs> <laughs> in theory right yeah. i'm going to share that with them <laughs> boundaries that's right <laughs> Um, so the current challenges, you know, you mentioned, you know, of course the, the challenges running an organization, which are presumably many, you know, uh, managing people, managing staff, managing volunteers, uh, getting funding, all those things. Um, what are some of the biggest ones that, uh, you're wanting to tackle and then in the same breath, because sometimes a challenge is an, also an opportunity. So um, what do you see are the opportunities within those challenges? Challenges, I think, will always um, be funding itself, getting mm -hmm. funding. Um, mm -hmm. With that, again, going back to our primary way, even as a 501c3 nonprofit, um, our primary way of raising money is by selling their crafts. Mm -hmm. So one of the important things to make that happen and to overcome that challenge is to keep working on designs. Mm -hmm. And so that this way we have something, we have a unique product. We have something that stands out. So instead mm -hmm. of trying to say, oh, here, you know, I buy this necklace that you've seen for the last 10 years, you know, um, just because it's going to help somebody. Instead, you see a necklace and you say, oh, that's beautiful. You're like, I, I want that necklace before you even know what the backstory is. And so, you know, kind of with that, being able to promote their designs almost ahead of the story um, and their story and the artists and before, you know, behind it, it's just an add-on to, um, you know, kind of why you already want to make the purchase. That's a wonderful spirit. I, I think that doesn't surprise me because your desire is to empower them and to empower them to be independent and that requires a certain amount of respect and so part of the respect is that they're first and foremost an artist or an artisan and so you want to help them have the best quality product and not just ask for handouts or you know like you said absolutely so um that that's that's powerful so uh, as they they try different designs what are some of the ways that they uh, explore and or are prompted to kind of do some new things do they get some training or have workshops or yeah um we uh, we do some training together we have a, a core group of about six women who are extremely talented mm -hmm. um but, you know, like people, you know, they'll come with different ideas and different designs, and then we work together, whereas I'll kind of, you know, like help tackle some of the challenges with the American market. Mm. So what would be the right colors to combine or designs that might, you know, like be more appealing to an American market versus their, you know, kind of within their own community. Mm -hmm. um, with that, uh, so I, I frequently br bring different fashion magazines That's a great so idea. that this way they can kind of be exposed to see what yes. it is that we see on a regular basis. And that also inspires them a lot with their designs. That's terrific. So um, that leads me to uh, sort of the final questions, which um, the, the sort of learning uh, the, and connection we can have here in Walden, because 
Uh, I'm thinking, you know, the artists I know all struggle with creating new markets for (laughs) (laughs) and demand for what they have. Mm -hmm. And sort of that's a common, you know, challenge. And then the tension between doing what you want versus what the market wants and and coming up with new ideas. And um, so so that's an interesting dialogue that can you imagine uh, somehow connecting those artisans with maybe uh, American artisans in some way, you know, like, because that's sort of something we that they share. It would definitely be an interesting collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'd be some really amazing ideas that would come from it. Yeah, I mean, that could be very interesting. And the other um, final question I was, I was curious about, uh, and that is this notion of community, because... Um, you talked about that at first, you know, the invitation to community through the, the camera, and then now you have established a commu- yourself in a community, um, and you're sustaining that relationship in a community, and you're observing this community and how it operates with itself. And um, what is something that we can learn? I mean, is there something Malden can glean that... Um, Maybe in small ways we can apply some principles. <laughs> yeah, I think absolutely. I, I do think the idea of community and to put aside that spirit of always having to be independent and I can just do it myself, mm-hmm. but to recognize the power of working together and that we can achieve so much more that way. Mm-hmm. A much more simpler step um, on visits, you know, like my early visits especially, Um, when they knew nothing about me or my life Mm -hmm. here in the States, they'd ask me about my neighbors. Mm -hmm. So what do your neighbors do when you're here? And it was a bit embarrassing (laughs) to acknowledge, I don't really know my neighbors that well. You know, I pass them by in a little wave and, you know, that's about it. And so with that, I've actually made an effort to get to know my neighbors better. You know, because after Mm -hmm. all, it is our community and Mm -hmm. our community is what we make of it. Mm -hmm. And the stronger connection that we make, make for a stronger community. That's a beautiful uh, way to end. Um, I'm inspired that you have allowed yourself to be influenced and it's this reciprocal uh, relationship. And now you're sharing that with Malden, where you live, and so we can benefit from it. (laughs) And uh, I want to end by saying, I have hope. (laughs) And this is a sign of a current campaign that um, Karen Sparacio Project Have Hope is inviting the entire world to participate and share hope. Uh, stories. I do believe, I believe the message of hope is so powerful and hope is what drives each one of us. Mm -hmm. Um, There's different experiences and challenges we've each faced Mm -hmm. and in those dark moments I feel like hope is the one thing that pulls us along Mm -hmm. and keeps us going and I think by sharing that Mm -hmm. message, um, the sharing of the message of hope is powerful in itself and so my hope with the campaign is to be able to create a much more positive, hopeful, worldwide community for all of us. making my raising my business half. I have hope for raising my children half. I have hope to to pay the school fees for my children. That's what I have. That's my hope.